This is the story of an organization that has worked for 40 years to make medicine safer around the world. The Uppsala Monitoring Center was set up in 1978 as the Foundation WHO Collaborating Center for International Drug Monitoring. Today we are a thriving organization of 100 people working here in Uppsala and we are celebrating four decades of scientific progress and we've also been very successful I think in building a global network of countries working together for safer use of medicines and for safer patients. And that's what we call pharmacovigilance, that's what we do. An anniversary celebration is a perfect opportunity to reflect on who we are and where we're going. But in order to do that, we also need to know where we're coming from. During 62 to 66, 67, uh, the World Health Assembly came up with the idea of having a center uh, in the world health organization for collecting reports on suspected new adverse reactions and also fatalities. There was a kind of general view uh, throughout WHO that the real problem of developing countries was that they didn't have enough drugs. The need was to get drugs out there rather than to consider whether they were safe or not. And then WHO realized that this is not the type of activity which should be in Geneva, in the WHO organization. It must be placed somewhere else. And then Sweden turned up and said, we are willing to take over the responsibility. One of the key uh, advantages Sweden had at that time was the development of a database-based support system for the agency. I think Sweden had a very strong role in the international program from the very beginning. And that was due both to the um, contributions by Åke Lillestrand and Barbara Westerholm. She was very much respected. During 1977, as far as I understand, there were discussions, negotiations happening between WHO uh, and the Swedish government uh, that the operational aspects of the program would be moved from headquarters to Sweden. We, we demonstrated actually the Swedish pharmacovigilance system to the Director General of the World Health Organization, which was a success meeting in, in, uh, at the premises of the Depart Department of Rights. And uh, then he realized that these are the guys that can do this. We were into big data way before it became uh, a, a catchphrase. We have always been technically advanced when it comes to a database, with the help of, of Permanel and the people at, at UDEC and their ideas. What we actually had, had to take over was a number of magnetic tapes. So what we physically did when Sten was recruited was to go down to Geneva and bring the magnetic tapes to Sweden. But then we did something different. We stored the magnetic tapes onto a modern, rather new. You should know that database technology of this kind didn't exist. It was actually in the years when it started to, to be developed. And uh, the University Computing Center had their own database uh, research and developed a system called Mimer. Mimer is one of the old Viking gods. He, he was, he was uh, sitting on the well where all knowledge in the world was co actually collected. And you had to ask Mimer if you'd like to know anything. Then uh, there was a rather suitable name for a for database management system. Thinking back, and technology was totally different then. And we had to write all the letters by typewriter. We didn't have any personal computers. The technical facilities were very simple. But first, 10 years or so, the progress was very slow. Uh, we were three, we had a secretary, so we were four, and of course we had IT consultants outside the centre. But that was it. Not until the beginning of the 90s we had the chance to 
to get more stuff. And we didn't know really where to start and we weren't expected by WHO to do very much research or looking into the database, just keep the da database going. That was the main task at the beginning. There was definitely a lot of confusion among the countries. Why are we all of a sudden supposed to send our reports to Uppsala to, uh, to a group that we really don't know? Some countries stopped reporting altogether. So I think the, the National Centre meetings were very important for the programme in general. But then we started to go out to other countries. And I think that was also very important, that other countries felt more involved, that they could host a meeting. And also they could show to their uh, ministers that this is important. And they felt the backup from other countries. Another important milestone was the publication of the first signals of potential harm caused by medicines. We had made some progress already around 1985 that we were really happy about. And it has to do with the contribution of the Dutch National Pharmacovigilance Centre. So there was Ron Mayboom, there was Bruno Stricker and Case van Dijk. And they were really very good at analysing signals. They then suggested that they would, would help us in um, developing signals together. And that's what we actually did for the first time, I think, in 1987. One of the first signals that we published, uh, I remember, was uh, Daltaism and depression. Uh, I was involved in that together with John McEwen in, in Australia. And this was the first time ever that we had managed to, to um, publish signals from the database. Uh, so it was real, real breakthrough. One of the first things I had to do was really to get signals that were clearly coming from uh, the UMC because the main effort was to provide information for countries to produce signals to help them. Initially, financial rules restricted what UMC could do to pursue its global goal of safer use of medicines. But these were overcome by making the drug dictionaries commercially available. So we started selling this drug dictionary, but this was a really complicated issue. We were not allowed to keep uh, revenues from um, any commercial activities. If we had such income, it should go either to the Swedish Treasury or to WHO. Oh, well, once, once we got our uh, uh, funding sorted, uh, that the, the, the restriction about uh, what the government would give us was, was, of course, irrelevant. We had to have a drug dictionary from, for all the brand names of drugs around the world that that uh, could be valuable. And indeed, it's uh, proven to be so that uh, almost everyone who has a need to see a global view of uh, medicines uses our, the WHO drug dictionary. Who drug now? The UMC was allowed to, to use um, funding uh, acquired from our commercial activities in our own activities. And all of a sudden, we had resources. Uh, and that made such a dramatic change. And that also allowed us to employ Ralph so he could become the medical director of, of the UMC. And I think that changed a lot because he came with a big network that we didn't have otherwise. So, so when I came as director, I uh, was faced with a, a situation of uh, very, a lot of concern and questions, very little resource, but a, a, a potential resource, and serving three different masters, the Swedish government, WHO, and the national centers. The program's efficiency and health of its global community have always depended on knowledge sharing which is why UMC created annual training courses for people working in the national centres and other stakeholders. 
the first course in, uh, in 1993, it was a wonderful occasion. It, uh, they, each course is a wonderful occasion. People come together, uh, they learn from each other, we teach them how to make the best use of uh, the UMC and uh, the data that we have. L lots of other things come up and they learn from each other and they remain friends, that's great, because uh, pharmacovigilance is a lonely job. We're always, we're, we're the people who find something wrong, which is never <laughs> a kind of popular thing to do. The people from different national centres globally coming together and interacting would help each other in learning more and establishing a more efficient system, I would say yes very much. It is, it is not only that it helps, it is very much needed. When we bring people from different national centres together and globally when we communicate to each other, I feel that they share their experience, they learn from each other and there is a lot to explore in this. And of course there are the meetings and also these, these education programmes which are run by the centre all over the world. Then you build up the, this personal contact. Digitalization is fine, but personal contacts are very important in some instances. UMC has gone from strength to strength, particularly since the 1990s, to extend the reach of the programme, to build global communities of pharmacovigilance professionals, and to encourage collaboration between pharmacists, caregivers, data scientists and patients. That is, that's what I'm proud of, that kind of uh, grouping of approaches is different from the standard public health perspective on pharmacovigilance. I think that the Centre 6 test speaks for itself. I mean, uh, there's been a tremendous growth of participating countries and that is actually a sign of the importance of the international programme and also the number of reports in the database. I mean, it's far beyond what we actually took over on the famous magnetic tapes in the 70s. I see sort of an exponential growth in the number of countries, in the number of reports into the database, in the number of people working on UMC, and the number of countries being involved in the, in the research being done, the um, signal work that's done, everything. I think that we should try to recognize that, that pharmacovigilance in the broader sense of the world has become much more important and it's become much more recognized as being important because I mean if you take vaccines, we take drugs, I mean you know what we can do to help people to get a better life is, is, is really very important. I think that the national authorities and the World Health Organization are all seeing that Without pharmacovigilance, we don't know what we're doing. If we have been able to inspire people out there, that's great. And I think we have done that. But it is really the hard work and dedication and passion by the people out in the field, in the countries. They build their pharmacovigilance systems and they maintain them. And if we can do a little bit to, to help them and support them with educational tools, with uh, training, we have data management tools that I think are useful. We have developed the methodology that they can apply in their country. It's a synergy. The, we are helping people in the countries, but they are actually helping us as well. Someone has said that it's like being a big family. And I think that's the, uh, the finest thing someone could say to me. But these past achievements are only part of the story. UMC looks to the future and continues to strive for even greater scientific innovation and success. We've had a research project on trying to get information from uh, the web and we, we should indeed be doing that uh, to f getting information also from patient health care records, anonymized of course. And that of course is a, a big change in focus where communication, complex data analysis, being able to put different kinds of data together we're working on that at the moment. I think the future development is on pharmacogenetics to find who runs the risk of uh, adverse effect uh, from uh, groups of medicines. I see it as going much further, and that is vigilance on all 
uh, medical care because there's an interaction between drugs and surgery, for example, that if you're taking a, a, a blood thinning anticoagulant drug uh, and you go for surgery, then obviously that could make the patient bleed. So the, the adverse drug reaction looks like an outcome from surgery, but it isn't. It, it only it's because of the drug. And there are many more things like that that I wish we could capture. So one of our key opportunities from a scientific perspective is to make better use of the information provided to us, not in the form of structured data prepared for the purpose of analysis, but in free-flowing descriptions of adverse events as experienced by patients or doctors and reported to us in the form of natural language. And this is an area where we've been doing exciting research in the team that I'm very proud of for a number of years, but it's also an area where I'm expecting we'll see even greater strides going forward and I think real value is soon being brought to the front lines of pharmacovigilance. I would like to thank everyone who has helped us to become what we are today and I'm looking forward to a really bright future. Our compass is set, the journey will continue.